will uh, start uh, discussing something new. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, uh, most of you know about these topics, at least have seen something in some form. Um, so the first portion of this lecture, these slides, uh, will be just recap. That's what, that's what I feel. And then we'll get deeper into uh, cache um, architectures. So when I talk about virtual memory here, we'll not really get into the details of virtual memory because that really belongs to an operating system. Here we are really talking about um, what a processor needs to offer to facilitate implementation of virtual memory. So uh, why virtual memory? Um, very basic question. And um, most of you probably feel that because it gives an illusion of bigger memory. Uh, that's not exactly true. Uh, that was not the reason why virtual memory was invented. Um, so, so, here is, so here is the question put in a different way. Um, in a 32-bit address space, you can access 4 gigabyte of physical memory. All right? um, of course, you will not get the full memory anytime because operating system will have some result memory okay. But still, even if I assume that you get 50% of 4 gigabyte, that's a huge amount of memory, 2 gigabyte. Okay. And the day-to-day -day applications that you run um, would probably be happy with 2 gigabyte. So then the question uh, arises is why virtual memory, right? Today, every machine comes with an operating system which has an elaborate virtual memory unit, or a memory management unit, which does all these Virtual memory is pretty stuck. So virtual memory was not invented because you wanted to give the user an illusion of bigger memory. There, there is a better reason for this. Um, does anybody know why? Multi-programming, Multi exactly. So that was the main reason. So the point is that there are important applications that have much bigger memory footprint. Uh, like databases, scientific applications operating on large matrices. Um, however, the point is that uh, even if your application fits entirely in physical memory, it seems unfair to load the full image at startup because none of these applications, even these ones, will require the entire memory footprint at any point in time. Okay. It will really require a small fraction of that. Okay. So that's the locality principle that we, that we believe in. So, however, if you do that, so if you if you actually try to load the entire memory footprint at startup for an application, what will happen is that it will take away memory from other processes that could run in the system, um, but probably doesn't need the full image at any point in time during execution. So it hurts multi-programming. Okay. So what virtual memory actually allows you to do is to um, take this particular physical memory and allows it to multiplex it on multiple processes. And that essentially requires a mapping process. You have a virtual address space, that is the application space. You have a physical address space, right? And you want multiple processes to share this physical address space. So essentially what this means is that you take a virtual address of some process that will get mapped to some physical address space, right? And this is the mapping that virtual memory actually establishes. And this allows you to bring small amount of data from the disk to the memory for a particular process, work on that, and then when you're done, eventually it gets thrown away. It gets replaced by probably some of its own data or some other processes data. So that allows you to do more multi-programming. Okay. If you did not have virtual memory, there would be no way of doing it actually. A process starts, it has a fixed physical address space, and you have to load the data and instructions exactly at that address. Just to give an example, suppose you have two processes, P1 and P2, right? And um, and if you, if, you, if you assume that the process address space is fixed, fixed in the sense that certain range of memory will be assigned to instructions, certain range of memory will be assigned to hit data, certain range of memory will be assigned to stack, etc., etc., then P1 and P2 will probably have the same address range for the instructions. We probably have the same address range for the game, etc. So now, if I want to run P1 and P2 together, there is no way to do it actually. P1 starts up, it fills up, so let's suppose that this is my physical memory. 
and let's say the, the lower portion of physical memory is reserved for code. Okay. So P1 starts up, it loads the entire code, it fills up the code area of the memory. Alright. Now when P1 gets context switched out, to be able to run P2, I have to remove this entire data okay, from memory to disk. Even though maybe this entire portion is actually free. I have no way to use it actually, because there is no way to translate this address into this address. It's a fixed address. Okay, all right. So that's why um, it hurts multi-programming, because <clears throat> to run P2 now you have to remove everything back to disk. You bring the, data, bring the data and instruction of P2 into here. The P2 runs for a while, and then again it, there's a context switch. Again, you have to do the same thing for P1. Okay, all right. So every context switch takes a lot of time. We will remove the data and instruction of one process, bring in the data and instruction of another process, and do the same thing. Okay. Even though you may have a huge amount of memory left unused, okay. there's no way to use that. So virtual memory allows you to do these things, and that was the main reason why it was introduced. It's not that it gives an illusion of bigger memory, but yes, it does in certain implementations. However, this is not always true. You can easily design a machine which has a smaller virtual address space compared to the physical address space, which is fine actually. The machine is still running. <coughs> Any question on this? So virtual memory, uh, since it's some form of a memory, it needs an address to access that. And that's called a virtual address. Um, so if you assume a 32-bit virtual address, every process will see 4 gigabyte of virtual memory, 2 to the power of 32. And this is much better than a 4 gigabyte physical memory shared between multi-program processes. Because now every process gets an exclusive 4 gigabyte virtual memory. Right? But when it runs, of course, ultimately, this is what is going to be used. Okay, so it will be multiplexed between uh, multiple processes. The size of virtual address is really fixed by the processor data pathway. Right? So um, that is the only thing that decides how big the virtual address is going to be. Right? For example, in a 32-bit machine, you cannot generate a virtual address which is bigger than 32 bits. Right? So there is no way to go beyond 4 gigabyte of virtual memory in such processes. Because you have seen that how virtual addresses get generated. For example, when you in MIPS, when you say something like um, load word dollar two zero dollar one, whatever this gets uh, computed to is the virtual address. All right. So that's what the processor is going to generate. Okay. And and its width is decided by the the width of this register, which is thirty two bits and thirty two bit processor. All right. So 64-bit processors, um, like um, the alpha line of processors, which are there, no, no longer there. Uh, Sun Ultra Spark, also not there anymore. Um, AMD Athlon 64 onward, Optarium, etc. IBM Power 4, Power 5, 6, 7. Uh, MIPS R10K onward, Intel Itanium, and today's all Intel processors. Okay. Um, provide bigger virtual memory to each process. Okay, because potentially, you can have a 2 to the power of 64 um, bytes of virtual address space. Although, normally, uh, you will never get 64 bits because there are certain bits reserved for certain segments and all these things. Uh, it will probably be smaller than that. Large virtual and physical memory is very important in commercial server market because there you need to learn to run large databases. So they are important, actually. Um, but of course, for day-to-day -day applications, well, it doesn't matter. So, so if, you, if, you're, if you're building a new machine, for uh, everyday applications, uh, you probably you can, you can can do away with your um, with your uh, um, virtual to physical memory uh, certain certain aspects of the virtual to physical memory translation layer. Okay. The only thing that you need to support is the multi-programming part. <coughs> you don't have to worry about the, the address space uh, size and all these things. So how do you address the virtual memory? There are primarily three ways to address virtual memory. Um, these are called paging, segmentation, and segmented paging. Um, how many of you haven't heard of any of these terms? Paging, anybody? Hasn't heard of paging? We're not talking about your uh, pagers. 
for which you said lessons. Teaching the points of all these things. Segmentations? Segmented virtual memory? And combination of these is segmented field. So what we'll do is we'll not focus on any of these two at all. Okay. Right? We'll look at um, flat paging only. Right? Because again, I, I treat this is not really um, a lecture on virtual memory as, as such. I'm only talking about the architectural support that is needed to do virtual memory. So what is paged virtual memory? The entire virtual memory is divided into small units called pages. Okay. Virtual pages are loaded into physical page frames as and when needed. This is called demand paging. Whenever a process needs a particular page, it will be loaded from the next level of memory, which is normally the disk, into your physical memory. Uh, and that portion of memory is called physical page frame. All right. So essentially, you're talking about a mapping process here. Um, if this is my virtual memory. And this is my physical memory. I divide the virtual memory into pages. I divide the physical memory into equal, equally sized uh, physical page frames. And then, if I if I need this particular virtual page, I look up here, find out a hole, okay, and put that data here. For example, maybe this is this is a hole where this will go, so, right? And so on and so forth. So the physical memory is also divided into equal size page frames. The processor generates virtual addresses, but memory is physically addressed, so you need a virtual address to physical address translation. Okay. The virtual address generated by the processor is divided into two parts, uh, page offset and virtual page number. Assume that you have a four kilobyte page size. Okay, sound system. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so that means I need twelve bits to access any byte within the page, right? Okay. So, within a thirty-two bit virtual address, lower twelve bits will be page offset. That's the offset within a page, and the remaining twenty bits are virtual page number. So that gives you one million virtual pages. Total. So one million times each page is four kilobyte, you get four gigabyte of virtual memory. Um, the page offset remains unchanged in the translation because whether it belongs to the virtual space or physical space, the offset within a page cannot change. Right? What changes is the position of the page when you move from virtual space to the physical space. So essentially, you need to translate the virtual page number to a physical page frame number. And this translation is held in a page table resident in memory. So first, we need to access this page table. So whenever you um, want to access any data, you need to do this translation. To go from virtual space to the physical space. And to, to be able to do that, you have to access this page table, which holds this translation. All right. um, and how is this translation established? Who establishes this translation? I start a program. Right. How does the translation get established? Who populates this table and how? Initially, the table should be empty, right, when the program starts off. Yeah? How and when? When you start the program. OK. Then it should be Is that right? So when you're allocating memory, it should be when you call malloc, at that time the table gets allocated, the population. Not a data structure is even will probably not go through the malloc, right? Dynamic memory is allocated to malloc. Certain structures in the stack. So when and how 
with this table get populated? Anybody who has taken an operating system course? Who hasn't taken an operating system course? Please raise your hands. Okay, the rest must have seen this. So what would be a, a meaningful way of doing this? What is common sense here? When you require memory. You didn't say anything about this table. But well, how, how do I, how do I, when, 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 when is the entry allocated in this table? So every process gets when a page yeah. When the requirement arises. When the requirement arises. Yeah, so, um, so whenever a process needs a page, it will be brought from the disk, allocated a physical page frame, and at that time the operating system establishes a translation and allocates an entry in the table. Okay, so now, since we need to access this particular table before we can go and access the data, there has to be a way to get to locate this table. Where is this table located? That's the first question we can answer, right? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so any answer to this question? What? Sorry. How do I find the page table? So you have gone into a new residence, residential complex, actually, right? You haven't been there before. So there's a central location where you can go and ask that, hey, I'm looking for this friend of mine. Where, which flat is he in, right? So I want to know that location of the central thing. How to get there? What is common sense here? That's exactly what you're looking for. So if I know the starting address of the page table, am I done? Is that enough? Yes. Why? So when you the offset and all, we can get to the point. Yeah. Which offset? So the page number offset. So we have a virtual address, right? Yes. Uh, so let's assume that you know the starting address of the page table. So this is my page table. Using the offset, you can... This offset? Yes, this offset. What is this offset? That's not the, that, what is that offset, somebody? Offset, offset, offset using a page, okay, all right? So let's assume that we know the starting address of the page table. Um, using the VPN, you map to the number, and then within the page, you get the address with this. No, no, I'm not worried about the page at this point. I just want to locate the page table entry in this table. VPN at the VPN. At the well, not exactly the VPN. VPN multiplied by the size of each other. Right, exactly. find out the page table entry corresponding to this virtual page so that I know the translation. You index to the VPNF entry of this page table. Is it the VPNF entry? Yes. You're assuming something in this entry table. Assuming a one page table, single. Uh, no, there is only one page table per process. Yes, that's true. No, 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 forget about that. Yeah, that's way too complicated. 
you're not even talking about. You're almost correct, but you're assuming something implicit. You're saying that starting from this, go down by a VPN amount, right? And this is the entry that I'm looking for. That has an assumption implicit in it. What does this entry contain? What address? Of the page, the page you are. What address? You have to verify. Physical, physical address. Physical address. Is it the physical address or the physical frame number? I said that the offset doesn't change in the translation. What does this entry contain? Physical frame. Physical frame number. Anything else? Offset doesn't change, right? It cannot change. I have a page in the virtual address space. I have the same page in the physical address space. So if I'm looking for a byte within the page, the offset here will be exactly the same as the offset here. That cannot change. Right? What will change is the location of the page. Right? And that is what the physical page frame number is. I need that. What <laughs> else is required? So you mentioned about a valid bit or something. So if it is valid page, if it is a valid page, can you even check the valid bit if it is strapped out? No, no, no. I'm, I'm not trying to even interpret the content. I'm just saying what, what are the contents of the entry. There is one valid bit. There is a physical page print number. What else is needed? What is common sense? It's all about common sense. There is nothing great about it. What else do you need here? Sounds no wait. wait. Some bits implement the replacement policy. Uh, can you elaborate? <coughs> Right, exactly. Okay, all right. So there are some replacement uh, state bits. Okay, what else? What else is needed? The page table entry. Is it actually memory? The address you want to show is it actually memory or do you need to do you need to bring it? Well, that's the valid bit, right? The translation is valid, the page is in memory for sure. That's the interpretation of the valid page. Do you need any permission fix? Rings a bell? Have you heard of that? Need some permission fix, right? Read drive permissions, read drive execution or whatever other permissions. And there is one more bit that's needed, and that's what is it? A dirty bit. To signify if the page is modified. Why is that needed? Somebody? Can you think of any use of that bit? So if you are so if some other person is replacing the page, uh -huh. then it should strap it to disk. Uh -huh. it, should, it should ask even to strap it to disk and then use the Exactly, right. So that dirty bit tells you when the page gets replaced, when the content should be written back to the disk one. Okay, so there are several things in this particular entry. So now coming back to the previous question, is it enough to go down by VPN entries here? VPN what? VPN number of entries or VPN bytes? VPN entries. VPN entries, right? So if I want an, want an address in terms of a byte address, how do I get that? Starting address plus? VPN multiplied by size of an entry. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, the page table best register, uh, PTBR, contains the starting physical address of the page table. Uh, PTBR is normally accessible in the kernel mode only, and this is set up by the operating system when a particular process is loaded into memory, when you're starting a process. 
So um, you need to know this. Okay, there is no other way to get to the correct entry. Right? So PTPR has to be known, and operating system knows it. So I assume that each entry in the page table is 32 bits. Um, and we have just discussed what these bits might be. Okay. Um, so this gives you the, the following formula for computing the page table entry address. PTBR plus VPN shifted by 2. VPN multiplied by 4 is actually. Yeah, right? So this, this gives you the byte address where I should read the page table entry corresponding to this particular virtual page number. So you access memory at this address to get the 32 bits of data from page table entry. These 32 bits contain many things, like a valid bit, the much needed physical page frame number, uh, which could be 20 bits for a 4 gigabyte physical memory with a 4 kilobyte page size, because that will have 1 million pages. Access permissions, like read, write, execute, and a dot or modified bit. Okay. And there could be many, many other things, like she has pointed out. You may need some replacement statements, and there are many other things. Right. Now the valid bit within the 32 bits tells you if the translation is valid or not. Right. If the bit is reset, that means the translation is invalid. Okay. So that is interpreted as the page is not resident in memory. And that results in something called a page fault. Right. So you have to do something to correct that fault. And um, so just to uh, make a correspondence with what we have been discussing, a page fault um, has to be a precise exception. Right? So when a particular load or store instruction takes a page fault, the pipeline has to be flushed, meaning that all instructions have to be removed. And we have to take the exception, come back and restart the load or store instruction. Okay. When you restart, hopefully this time, there won't be any page fault. The page has been brought into the so in case of a page fault, the kernel needs to bring in the page to memory from disk. So that's what is really needed to be done. The disk address is normally provided by the page table entry. So there's a different interpretation of the remaining 31 bits. Okay. So you have this 32-bit entry, right? Normally, this 32-bit entry would be interpreted as having a physical page frame number, permission bits, etc., etc. Provided the valid bit is set. If the valid bit is reset, then the remaining 31 bits actually give you a disk address how to locate this page on the disk. Right. So also the kernel needs to allocate a new physical page frame for this virtual page. Um, if all frames are occupied, it invokes a page replacement policy, right. which essentially picks a page, uh, swaps it with a new page. OK, so uh, page faults take a long time, order of milliseconds, usually. Um, why, why, why does it take so long? Which one? Reading this. Sorry? Reading this takes. Why is it slow? Reading this. I don't know. Reading this. Reading this. Printing the screen doesn't take reading. That's also a right. Why is the disk particularly slow? Right, these are mechanical devices. So we rotate the disk to bring the head to the right point. It's a mechanical process. That's very slow. Um, so you must have heard of the sick time and all these things, right? Ready to this. Okay. So the point is that, of course, that means the page replacement policy must be intelligent. Because you don't want to take a page for too often. Which means you, have, you, you must replace a page which is not likely to be used in the near future. Okay. That's what you need. What you need. So again, I, I'm not going into detail of this, because this is not the topic of this course. I'll just assume that there's a black box algorithm which would replace some page. Okay. That's it. Right. So once the page fault finishes, the page table entry is updated with a new virtual page number to physical page frame number mapping. Um, of course, if the valid bit was set to start with, you get the physical page frame number right away without taking a page frame. Okay. Finally, the page frame number is concatenated with the page offset, this offset, okay, uh, to get the physical address. So this is what it looks like. You just replace the virtual page number by the physical page number. That's it. Okay. So this is the physical address um, that the processor can use now to issue a memory request to get the necessary data. Okay. So in summary, you really need two memory accesses to get a piece of data. Because the first memory access is to get the translation done. 
the FBI access the page name. And once you have the physical address, then you actually can go and access the data. Okay. So can we improve this? Because it looks ridiculous, right? To get one piece of data, I have to make two memory accesses every time. Exactly. So there's a name of this structure. Sorry? What does it stand for? That's an acronym. Translation to Kassai Thank you. So, uh, <coughs> so um, again, here, uh, if you apply common sense, that tells you that uh, you should be able to cache the most recently used translations. Right? Okay. Um, and this particular cache has a special name. It's called translation look aside buffer, or TLB. Uh, it's essentially a small set of registers um, which store the most recently used translations to these registers. And normally, the TLB is fully associative, but it could be anything. Okay. It could be a set associative structure also. So a fully associative, what I mean is that um, whenever you have a virtual address, or rather a virtual page number, and you're looking for the corresponding translation, you have to search through all these registers. It could be anywhere, this particular translation. You search through all these registers to find out where the translation is. You may or may not find it, actually. So each TLB entry has two parts. It has a tag, which is simply the virtual page number. And it has the corresponding page table entry. Okay. So a TLB looks like this. bunch of entries and this is one translation register okay. um, and each register has two fields one is a tag one is a page table entry of course you can probably have a valid bit also and it may have replacement state bits okay. so what happens is that you have a virtual address VPN and offset. So what I want to know is, given that VPN, tell me the corresponding page frame number, physical page frame number. That's what is the required requirement okay, of the translation process. So what you do is, as, as is mentioned here, the tag is the VPN. All right? So you store the VPNs here. So you take this VPN, compare against all the tags. Okay, all right? At most one will match. Okay. Whichever matches, you look up, you take the page table entry of that one, and that is that gives you the transfer. If nothing matches, that's called a TLB miss. And if now you really have no option but to go and access the page table. So um, each entry has two parts: the tag, which is simply the virtual page number, and the corresponding page table entry. The tag may also contain a process ID. Why? What circumstances do you require a process ID to have? Essentially, what I'm saying is that I'll extend my VPN by the process ID as well. Okay. So I'll have another field here, which is the PID. And what I'll do is now, my 
TLB hit process will change a little bit. I'll not only compare VPN with the tag, I'll also compare the ID of this process with these. Both must match. Okay, then I have a TLB, otherwise not. Why do I need this? No, TLB is not part process. TLB is inside the process. I always need. Why? Otherwise, any process can access this TLB, uh, right? And can access the page for one. Okay. It can misuse the page. Right? The permission that, we, that person doesn't have that permission, and still we can misuse the page. So you're saying that um, a process was running, yeah. has uh, cached certain translations. And given that the virtual address space of all processes is identical, another process may come in later, generate the same virtual page number, look up the TLB, pick up a translation, and can go and access the page. Right? Yes, you're correct, absolutely. And to prevent that, you need a process ID. Can I do away with the process ID and still be correct? I, I tell you that I. It's not really required. I can do something to get rid of process ID as well, which is why it says main. No, you cannot do that. Virtual addresses are generated by the compilers. Is everyone following what he's talking about? Okay. So I'm saying that yes, that's correct. Um, the problem that he has mentioned can be avoided by having the PID, but I'm saying that um, I can fix it otherwise also. <clears throat> so it has to be between two processes, right? There is no problem with a single process. And between the two processes, uh, between <coughs> Running these two processes, there has to be some one particular event that has to happen. What is that called? A context switch has to happen. Can I do some extra work during context switch to fix it? Yeah? Exactly. I can just invalidate all the all the entire TLB, right? So that's called a TLB flush. So on context switch, if I flush my TLB, then I won't require the PID. What is the downside of it? What do I lose by doing it? Do I lose anything? Of course, I gain back something in terms of storage. I don't need to store the PID anymore. I simplify my TLB heap also. What am I losing? By I have to repopulate the table, exactly. So there will be a cold start effect whenever a process is uh, brought in. Okay, right? There has to be a cold start effect. And the bad thing is that I'm doing this in a very conservative way. I'm assuming that there will be a conflict, okay. which may not actually be true. Okay. Right? So that's why um, if you do not have a process ID, you lose in terms of performance normally. Okay. Because every process will see a cold start effect whenever it is switched in. Uh, having a process ID can simplify, can give you back the performance. Downside is that your TLP becomes bulky. Okay, so that's all. Because these process IDs are not really small IDs. These are large numbers. Okay, so on a TLP hit, you just get the translation in one cycle. Uh, may take slightly longer depending on the design. Um, on a TLP miss, you may need to access memory to load the page table entry in the TLP. So again, uh, there's a may here. Can somebody guess what else can I do? So I'm saying that I missed the TLB, which means I did not find this virtual page number anywhere in any of these entries. Now, the, the obvious solution is to go and access the page table and get the translation. I'm saying that I can do something else also, which is why there's a main. Yes. Can I store the translation somewhere else? I look up the TLB first, I miss the TLB. And immediately before going to page table, can I look up somewhere else? Yeah. 
can you think of it? Okay, anyway, so the answer is that um, nothing stops me from caching the transmissions in the cache directory, in my data cache, for example. Because it's just normal data. It has an address, it has a value. So I can just put it in the cache also. So I miss the DMP, I think of my cache. If it is not there, then of course I don't put it. So we'll talk about this more later. Today, almost all processors actually do this. Uh, they, they put the translations in some level of the cache. Okay, so we'll talk about that. And normally there are two TLBs, instruction and data. Why? <coughs> Why is that? Why not a single TLB? The single TLB would give you better utilization for sure. Sorry? Exactly. You avoid structural hazards. Because in a pipeline processor, in a single cycle, I may have to access the instruction TLB. I mean I may want to access the TLB for instruction as well as for data. Right? As soon as I mean whenever the fetch and the memory stages will be aligned to the same cycle, there will be in the pipeline processor. The structural hazard will arise. So another way of resolving is that you have a single TLB with two access ports. And you allow to access the instruction data. Okay. All right. So but Anyway, so today all processors actually have separate instruction data. Okay, so once you have completed um, the virtual address to physical address translation, you have the physical address. So the question is, what's next? So you need to access memory with that physical address, um, but you actually do not directly access memory. You first access your caches. Um, so instruction data caches are essentially um, uh, small memory structures inside your processor that hold most recently used, that is temporarily closed, and nearby, that is spatially closed data. Okay. So, so what does this mean? That means um, if I'm accessing a particular data point now, um, I assume that I'll require this data point again in near future. So it makes sense to cache. So that's called temporal locality, and that's what is uh, being exploited by the cache. And also, whenever whenever I access a particular data point, I usually bring in subsequent few data points together. Because the assumption is that since I'm accessing this data point, I'll probably need those by data points also. So that's called spatial locality. And uh, so, so this is what the caches give you, these two types of locality. Okay. So we'll talk more about this, how actually you achieve this. So use the physical address to access the cache first. Caches are organized as arrays of cache lines or cache blocks. Each cache line holds several contiguous bytes, 32, 64, 128 bytes. So how do you address a cache? The physical address is divided into several parts, um, usually tag, index, and a block offset. Okay. Um, the block offset determines the starting byte address within a cache line. The index tells you which cache line to access. So remember that cache is an array of cache lines. Right? So this index tells you which cache line I should access. And this one tells you, within that cache line, which bytes I should access, okay, where my access should start. In that cache line, you compare the tag to determine hit miss. So this is what it looks like. Um, so you take the physical address, divide it into three parts. Okay. And the index tells you which cache line to access. So this is my cache, okay, array of cache lines. Each cache line has two things, tag and the data. So the index tells me which uh, things to access. I take the tag, compare it with this tag. All right. If the comparison passes, then only I pick up the data, All right. not otherwise. So if I pick up the data, then the question arises, this is this is a large chunk of data, right? I just said that it's 32 bytes, 64 bytes, and 128 bytes. But if we look at the mixed instructions that we have that we have been discussing, um, these are like a 32-bit processor, these are at most oh my, four bytes, right? Load word has four byte access. The question is which four bytes I should access if it's a load word instruction. So block offset tells you from where I should start within these 32 bytes. Okay. And my instruction tells me the access size, that is how many bytes. If it is load word, it will be four bytes. If it is load half, it will be two bytes. If it is load byte, it will be one byte. So starting from there, I'll access those many bytes. 
and that's what is my final data that's returned to the processor. There are some state bits as well, uh, which tells me, for example, valid, invalid, and many other things, which will discuss very soon. So this is roughly how the cache works. Any question? Okay, so let's take an example. So let's suppose that we have a 32-bit physical address. Um, cache line is, let's say, 64 bytes, which means the block offset is 6 bits. With 6 bits, I can represent any starting point in 64 bytes. Um, and let's assume that the number of cache lines is 512, which means I need 9 bits of index to decide which cache line to access. So the remaining 17 bits are going to be tagged. How, how do I get that? So I have 6 bits of block offset, 9 bits of index. So I'm left with 17 bits out of 32 bit address. These are my tags. Okay. So what's the size of this cache? I have 512 lines. Each line is 64 bytes. Right? So the cache size is this much, which is 32 kilobytes. Okay. Each cache line contains the 64 byte data. So I said the line size is 64 bytes, right? 17 bits of tag, one valid invalid bit, and several state bits, such as shared, dark here, etc. So we'll probably not talk about this particular bit at all in this course, or maybe a little bit. This one tells you if this cache block is modified or not. Um, since both the tag and the index are derived from the physical address, this is called a physically indexed, physically tagged cache. Right. So we'll see other variants very soon. OK, so essentially what you do is you take the physical address, take these 17 bits of tag, go to this particular index, whichever index you need to access, compare the tags. If, if the comparison passes, it's a cache hit. You access the data. Otherwise, you have to go and access the data from the point. Okay. okay, so the example uh, assumes that you have one cache line per index, right? but it doesn't have to be such. Um, so this is called a direct mapped cache, uh, which which maps a particular index to one unique cache block. The problem here is that a different access to a line evicts the resident cache line because it may happen that there are two physical addresses with the same index bits. Right? It can happen. And then what will be the problem? The problem is that both of these cache lines will map to the same index in the cache. Because there is a collision now. So only one will find room. Other has to be replaced from the cache, which is not very good. So how do you solve this? The solution is, um, so this is called this, this is called a capacity or a conflict miss. Okay. Because see, you have two addresses calling on the same index, which means at any point in time, you can cache only one of them. Whenever you access the other one, there will be a cache miss. And the cache miss is because of um, either a conflict between these two addresses, or simply, you can, you can also see it as a capacity miss because if you had a bigger cache, probably these two blocks would map to different indices, right? Because if you look at this example, if I double the number of lines in the cache, right, 1024 lines, there will be 10 bits now in the cache index, okay? So suppose I have two physical addresses. These two portions are exactly the same. All right? So then these two addresses will map to the same cache line. Okay. But suppose the 10th bit here is 0, 10th bit here is 1. Okay. All right. So now if I double my cache, okay, so suppose I make 1024 lines in my cache, then the index bits will be 10, right? Then these two addresses will actually map to different, different cache lines. And the conflict will disappear. So it's very difficult to say whether it's a conflict miss or a capacity miss. Okay. So of course, there is a way to categorize them correctly. So we'll talk about that soon. Um, 
But for now, we just say that um, the problem is either a capacity miss or a conflict miss. Is this clear? Okay. So conflict misses can be reduced by providing multiple lines for index. That's one solution. Here we have talked about one solution that is you double the cache size or I mean you increase the cache size. The other one is you keep the cache size unchanged, but you allow multiple lines per index. So access to an index now returns a set of cache lines instead of just one cache line. For an n wise set sensitive cache, there are n lines per set. And now you have to carry out multiple tag comparisons in parallel to see if any one of the set um, hits. So here's an example. So this is a two-way set associative cache. A particular index corresponds to two different cache lines. All right. So which means we access both of these tags, compare both of these against this one. Okay. At most one will match. Right. If none of them match, that means you have a cache miss. And whichever matches will give you the data. So now this problem is gone actually. Two lines will decide here. PA1 will go here, PA2 will go here. And they, they will coexist in the cache. So um, now, when you need to evict a line, that's because it may happen that now there are three actors that map to the same index, right? So when the third address shows up, you have to make room for it by replacing one of the other two, okay, right? And now you have an option which one to replace, which you did not have already, okay? So you need some algorithm here to decide which one to replace. So that's the cache replacement policy. Um, so you run a replacement policy. LRU, for example, least recently used, is a good choice. Um, keeps the most frequently and most recently used lines, favors temporal locality. So that's how you reduce the number of conflict pieces. So if time permits, we'll look at some of the replacement policies. Uh, but again, I'll not go into detail of that. So there are two extremes of set size. One is direct mapped, which is a one-way set of state cache. And fully associative, where all lines are in a single set. Right? Like the TLB example we talked about. It's a single set, you have to make all the value. So here's an example. Suppose you have a 32 kilobyte cache, which is two-way set of city, and line size is 64 bytes. So what is the number of indices or number of sets? So essentially, how does it look like, this particular cache? So there are two arrays of cache lines. This is OA0, this is OA1, right, okay. Um, so line size is 64 bytes. So each way is 16 kilobytes, right? Okay. 16 kilobytes here, 16 kilobytes here. So uh, how many lines do we have? So 16 kilobytes divided by 64 bytes, okay. Um, so that's basically um, 256. So this is 256. All right, so you, you require eight index rates. So whichever index you get, um, that will give you two lines. So that's my set. Okay. So that's a two-way serosative 32 kilobyte cache. All right. Another example is, suppose you have the same size and line size. 32 kilobyte capacity, 64 byte line size, but it's a fully associative cache. What does it mean? You have number of sets equal to one. So all your cache blocks are in a single set. Okay. So, um, so it looks like this. Etc. So you have all the cache blocks in a single set. Okay. Um, so within the set, there are 512 lines, and you need 512 tag comparisons for each access. Here we need just two, we need 512. Okay, so that's why fully associative caches are expensive. You need to make a lot more comparisons. Okay, all right. But what is the advantage? Does anybody see? Is there an advantage of doing a fully associative cache over a 
state of solution. Otherwise, why, why are we even talking about this? So in general, what happens if I increase the associativity of the cache? So keep in mind that my goal of designing the cache is to maximize the number of hits. Okay. That's what I want, because, because cache misses are slow. But do I get that by increasing the associativity? I do, right? Because the number of conflicts normally should go down. Okay. That's actually not true. Um, it happens only up to a certain point. So we'll get to the detail of that very soon. The curve looks like this. If you plot associativity against miss rate, okay, or number of misses, it will look like this. So there's an optimum point beyond which the number of misses will again start increasing. So we'll explain that very soon. Okay. 